Um, our first reader lived in Colorado, Georgia, and South Carolina before discovering the magical city of Chicago. Now she can be spotted drinking blood, searching for the world's best tapas bar, and writing in coffee shops all over the Windy City. Her current project is a digital series called King Solomon's Wives, a modern thriller about women alive today who descended from King Solomon's ancient harem. It's full of historical conspiracy and, well, harem sex. <laughs> the series is interactive, meaning readers get to vote on the direction of the story. The first three episodes are available now, and episode four comes out... The end of the year. At the end of the year. Please welcome to Tuesday Funk, Holly McDowell. cards if you, like anybody wants one let's like take one home and remember and the the episode one is actually free right now on Amazon just people cool. and I'm totally not reading from that tonight <laughs> I'm reading from this other book that I'm working on it's a YA novel and it's my work in progress it's called snake eyes a 15 year old 15 year old Claire Fars leads an unchallenging and unfulfilling life uh, fitting into the expectations of her preacher father and his nosy controlling congregation who basically paid for her entire existence. After a series of events that seemed to be siphoning away her freedom and independence and her confidence, um, she decides to make a change. She's going to play a game where she rolls the dice to make decisions. She's hoping it's going to force her to take risks and change her life forever. So this chapter is not the first chapter. It happens uh, the morning after she decides to start playing the game. It's my dice life. The dice will make the decisions that I keep getting wrong. The ones that usually lead me home to play Monopoly with mom. The first thing I do when I wake up is roll. Will I sneak a cup of dad's coffee before I leave for school? The dice say yes. Before long, I'm on my way to school, sipping coffee as I walk. I'm probably stunting my growth, according to copious medical literature, but I don't care. I'm doing something I'm not supposed to, something an adult would do. By the time I get to the convenience store at the corner of Ashland and Augusta, I feel that caffeine high people talk about. Mixed with the adrenaline I'm feeling from using the dice, it's like I'm floating. I could get used to this. Passing the store gives me an idea. It sells fashion magazines that dad won't let me buy. They're a waste of money, he always says, and their only function is to get you to waste still more money on more things. No, Claire. I stop by the window and I make a roll. The dice tell me to go ahead to school, not to buy the magazine, so I don't. I'm still floating, though. If I let the dice make my decisions, I have to accept that sometimes they'll make the safe choice instead of the dangerous one. It's OK. I'm going to follow them, for now, wherever they lead. At lunch, I roll about whether to eat with Kiri or Rania, my best friends, or to sit with someone new. The dice tell me to make a new friend. I sit next to a short, skinny kid with a mustache named Robert, who I think just moved to town, and we end up discussing music and throwing skittles at unsuspecting classmates. Robert salutes me as he, as he heads off to class, and I feel like I'm really cool. Mm -hmm. The next day, I find myself alone in the bathroom between second and third period. I take out the dice and I roll. They tell me to stall for 10 minutes before going to class. I lean against the back wall and I play with my phone for a while before heading to history. I was dealing with a female issue, I whisper to Miss Moanash as I come in late. She doesn't question my behavior at all. I'm getting away with everything. Already, the dice have taught me an important lesson. If you act like you haven't done anything wrong, People believe you. It's all about confidence. The air conditioner is broken at church again. I'm sitting in the pew, sweating, because I can't wear shorts to service. Not even on this one on Wednesday night, which is supposed to be casual. At least I'm in a different row than Mom, so she can't see me moving the dice between my fingers. Dad can't see either from his pulpit, as I carefully pull them out of my pocket and drop them onto the seat beside me. It's a two and a six, and I obey. I bend forward, holding my stomach like it hurts, and then I get up and sneak out the back door. I pull out my headphones, and I listen to music as I circle the church building, wandering, enjoying being outside. No one comes out to check on me, so I walk all the way to the convenience store again, and I buy a soda. I sit on a bench 
and I watch the cars go by. My stomach doesn't hurt at all. Instead, it's full of magical butterflies. By the time the service is over, I'm back in the vestibule. Poor thing with a sick tummy, Mom says as she hugs me as we're walking home. Dad adds, you'll need to get to bed early tonight, young lady. At home, I slip the dice under my pillow and get to sleep early indeed. I sleep soundly. By the time I get to school the next day, I realize I'm ready for something even bigger. I want to jolt my life with electricity and risk. I also want to show off the new clear to anyone who's paying attention. After lunch, I steal away to the benches in front of school. I ask my question and I shake the dice. Odd means I'll look for that guy I saw selling weed after school. And if he's got any, buy a little. <laughs> All right, come on, change my life. The dice slide across the concrete bench and one even falls off onto the grass. It's still clearly showing one side up. It's a four, and the die that landed on the bench is a three. Awesome. <laughs> My last three classes are a blur. This keeps falling. Yeah. Oh, just... <laughs> My last three classes are a blur. I build fun little fantasies in my head about the guy who sells weed and how impressed he'll be when I ask for a bit of his stash. In my head, he's like, anything for a fellow subversive. <laughs> I'm like, it's all cool. I have to be at church by 4.30, so I'll only have a few minutes to kill after class. I wait by the shuttles, and after the big ones pull away across the way, I see weed guy leaning against the wall with one knee bent. He's wearing a Kiss t-shirt, and it's so hot out, his glasses keep fogging up. He takes them off and cleans them and puts them back. Now he sees me. Claire, he says, and he waves. He's smiling. He must remember me from the party last weekend and he's clearly happy I've arrived. I can't believe it. I remember our encounter at the party clearly. We talked about subversive books and how everyone at school acts exactly the same as everybody else and how lame it is. I remember liking him. Suddenly I'm nervous. My eye twitches as I walk over and my hands quake as I push my hair behind my ears. I feel insecure, but I'm goddamn going to obey the dice. Resisting conformity as always, I ask, and I lean against the wall. <laughs> Weak I laughs. You're not like any preacher's daughter I've ever met. Ugh, behind the smile on my face, I panic. He knows now about my father, my life, everything. I fight to keep the corners of my mouth from turning down. Kiri must have told him. I wonder if he asked her or if she just volunteered the information. I'm so embarrassed. I'm encased in porcelain, my exterior shaped and molded into what a bunch of boring old people want it to look like. I want to smash it. How best to do that? Obey the dice. What are you selling, I ask. Got any left? I got plenty. He raises a brow. Why, is the pastor's daughter up for getting high? Only if the teen drug dealer does it with her. I wouldn't say no to that. He holds out his hand and I shake it. I'm Jack. Jack. No, I'm Jack. Your name is Claire. Cut it out. <laughs> Next, I do a combination of things I've never done before. Walk through the parking lot, since I don't have a car or driver's license. After school, since I always have to go right home to avoid the accusation of dallying. With a guy since most of my friends have been girls over the years. Making jokes, humorless fars is one of Kiri's favorite nicknames for me. I'm in the clouds, I feel like I could do anything. Jack leads me towards some vans in the back. Not sure what these ominous vehicles are used for, but they'll provide us some shelter. He walks between them and motions me to come with. He pulls out two thirds of a marijuana cigarette and a lighter. You know how, he asks. I shake my head. All right. You inhale deep into your lungs. Hold it in for a few seconds, then breathe it out. Watch. Jack holds a cigarette between his thumb and index finger and he draws it to his lips. His chest expands as he takes a long breath. He removes the cigarette but holds his mouth closed. He raises his brows like he's asking if I get it. I get it. <laughs> he exhales. How does it make you feel, I ask? Well, it kind of pulls you inward. You sort of focus on little things right around you, instead of worrying about the whole big world. It's an escape, I guess. Ready? Yeah. He hands me the cigarette, and I do exactly as he explained, and then I cough it out. I cough a lot. I can barely breathe, and unfortunately, neither of us has had the foresight to bring any water. But once the stinging stops, I start to feel light and relaxed. I take another hit, and after a few moments, 
I start to notice Jack's head. It's very nicely shaped. <laughs> There's a slight crook to his nose. His lips are full, but not like overly so. I also never noticed his hair so closely. I thought it was curly, but it's just a little wavy. He's staring at me too, like maybe he's noticing little things about me. His eyes are brown and glimmering. You've got a dimple under your right eye, he says. I take another hit. Now I'm staring at the van. The paint is rusting off around the wheels. I say, I wonder if this van has ever carried a dead body anywhere. <laughs> Probably, Jack says. I take another hit. Now we're looking at the man again. Jack makes a face in the window and we both laugh. I puff out my cheeks and he slaps them to force the air out and it sounds like a fart. Jack is the first to notice the old skateboard in the dumpster. He's cracking up as he runs over and grabs it. You're gonna bust open your skull falling off that thing, I laugh. No, I won't, you will, hop on. I can barely keep my balance because of my giggles. He wraps his arm around my waist and guides me forward a few feet, a few more. I laugh so hard I fall, my feet thrusting the board back. Jack catches me and we both tumble to the ground. His face stops close to mine. He smells like cinnamon and honey. He makes me so nervous I remember that I was supposed to be somewhere else. I sit up and look around for my phone. Oh God, what time is it? Late for church, he asks, pulling his phone from his back pocket. It's 4.30. Even if I run, I'm going to be a half hour late, and I'm sure I smell like weed. I'm going to be in trouble, but it's worth it. If Jesus reads minds, then he'll know why. The dice, they've already changed my life.